to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the room starts to populate, um, we will give just everyone a chance just to come in. The numbers are still ticking up. Sorry that we're a little late starting. Um, we will be with you in just a second once the numbers stop ticking up. Okay, it looks like we have everybody. So let's get started. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Williams. I'm the marketing manager for Indiana University Press. On behalf of the press, I'd like to welcome you all this afternoon to a special book launch for What Folklorists Do, edited by Tim Lloyd. Here is the book. We are going to have a special panel discussion to celebrate the book this afternoon. And before we get started, uh, let me do a little quick piece of housekeeping. If you have a question for the panel, there is a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Please enter any Q questions that you might have there. And in case after you watch this presentation, you are inspired to buy a copy of the book, you can get it from anywhere you like to buy books. Um, and if you'd like to buy a copy from the press's website, that would be iupress.org. And if you use the code SAVE30 at checkout, you will get a 30% discount. So enough rambling from me. Before, before we go any further, let me introduce you to Tim Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you all for coming today. I appreciate your being here. I appreciate your interest in this book. Uh, what we're going to do is have uh, me as the editor and four of the contributors to the book talk a little bit about the book and their essays in it. And uh, uh, our authors will, will uh, uh, excerpt a bit from the essays that are in the book. Uh, and then we will open the session to questions for most of the, uh, of, of the time that we have together this afternoon. So I will begin. Uh, first, I want to thank all the contributors to what folklorists do for their belief in this project and their commitment to it, and for sticking with that commitment, especially through an unexpectedly crazy year and a half for all of us and, and for the entire world. Uh, I also want to thank the Indiana University Press and its great staff for its terrific support of this project from start to finish over the last year and a half or so. So what is what folklorists do? Well, it's several things. First, it's a compilation of 76 brief, informal, personal essays by folklorists from across our field. Essays that describe the range of work those folklorists do and the ways their training in folklore studies informs that work. I group the essays into four sections, researching and teaching, leading and managing, communicating and curating, advocating and partnering. And my introductory essay stresses the many contributions that an education in our field can make across our culture and society. What folklorists do is also a response to a perceived problem. As you all know, it's hard to go for long these days without being faced with yet another news article or op-ed about the perilous state of the humanities. Enrollments in humanities majors and classes and job prospects for those with humanities BAs are trending downward, it is said. Jokes and other narratives about humanities PhDs waiting tables or needing to learn how to write computer code to be seriously employed are never in short supply. But the situation of those humanities PhDs who can only find piecemeal work without benefits and secu or security is no joke. At the same time, a new narrative has also begun appearing, one whose writers question the interpretations of the data that humanities doomsayers make. This new narrative proposes, on the other hand, that the ability to think critically and pursue qualitative research, to listen with openness and interpret with empathy, and to deal with complexity and ambiguity, all abilities that are at the core of humanities education are exactly what is most needed in the world today and in the foreseeable future. And this is an insight that employers of all kinds are also increasingly realizing. In the last 10 years or so, several of the learned societies uh, that represent fields in the humanities have been focusing a lot of attention on preparing graduate students and early career professionals in their fields for what are called alt-act positions, which draw upon the core competencies that humanities education provides 
to offer alternatives to the diminished number of tenure track faculty positions in the academy. But as folklorists, you and I know a secret. And that secret is that the field of folklore studies has been at work on this project quietly, but with some success for a number of decades. So what folklorists do also takes the lid off that secret by bringing to light many of the present day outcomes of our field's long history of engagement with these issues of purpose, usefulness, and public service. What folklorists do is also a practical demonstration through more than six dozen case studies of the enduring value of folklore studies as a, humani as a core humanities discipline. Since its founding, our field has advanced several fundamental ideas, among them these three. Number one, that vernacular narratives, objects, beliefs, and performances offer especially productive routes toward understanding the identities and values people and communities create, and the extent and the operations of human imagination. Number two, that folklore learned, practiced, and transmitted largely outside official settings and channels constitutes a significant proportion of all cultural expression, not just a minor corner of it. And number three, that folklore shapes and is shaped by everyday life in our own or any time and place, not just in the past or somewhere else. Using the core concepts of our field, including art, context, folk, genre, group, identity, performance, text, and tradition, to name just a few. Folklorists work within the shared intellectual and social culture of what I've called listening discipline to understand the intersections of artfulness and the social world of everyday life, community-based creativity in a global economy, and both communication and conflict within and across religious, geographic, and ethnic divides. By showing the range of productive and substantial work that is informed by these fundamental ideas and approaches, what folklorists do also provides solid content for early career folklorists or those considering entering our field, and even those of us who've been around for a while, in our conversations with our friends, families, and colleagues describing or justifying our career choice or our current projects. And it's narratives about many of the things that folklorists do best will be compelling to those who are considering or ought to be considering hiring folklorists. But for me, it's also something else, something personal. Many years ago, I discovered the field of folklore studies when I made a left turn for music education where I thought I would spend my professional life. It's fair to say that at my end, it was love at first sight. And that love has only deepened through the experiences I've since had in our field. So even what folklorists do is all the things I've just alleged it is. It is one other thing. For me, this book project as a whole is intended as a kind of love letter about and to the field. Now let's hear from four of the book's authors. As it turned out, the first four people I asked who were available this afternoon are or recently were at universities. But the range of work they do which puts them into different chapters of the book, challenges all too simple ideas of what the academy is all about. The other authors in the book, those not represented this afternoon, also challenge oversimplified assumptions, whether about the public sector, the private sector, or something completely different. First up today is Daniel Christensen, assistant professor in the Department of Religion and Culture and faculty in the Material Culture and Public Humanities graduate program at Virginia Tech, the title of her essay and what folklorists do is doing public humanities. Danielle. Thanks, Tim. And thank you for really your tremendous work wrangling all 70 or so of us. Um, I also wanted to thank the staff at IU Press for helping to bring the project to um, fruition. And to all of my colleagues who are not speaking on this call, I just got a copy of the book myself and it is really making me homesick for you. So thank you for your contributions. Um, my my essay in the book is called Doing Public Humanities, and I'll be uh, giving you about a five minute condensed version of that. I'm speaking specifically from the perspective of a, uh, somebody at a R1 institution that cares a lot about research and also about teaching. So here we go. Well into her 80s, my great grandmother made scrap quilts, sewing random widths of stripes, plaids, florals, and paisleys across paper diamonds cut for magazines. After trimming these unruly rays, she pieced them into pulsing eight-pointed stars connected by buffering stretches of plain cotton. 
One of her quilts covered my twin says sized waterbed, really, um, as a teenager. Like the speaker in Teresa Palomo Acosta's poem, My Mother Pieced Quilts, every morning I awoke to these October ripened canvases, armed, ready, shouting, celebrating. I wondered how Mary Verona Cox Smythe had staked out her plant, what separate testimonies were caught in the fragments of poplin and seersucker and flower sack. Eventually, these questions moved me to study vernacular culture in college. Like other folklorists, I am drawn to what Bell Hooks has called humanizing survival strategies, embodied theory and critique, the everyday habits of being, forms of artistic expression, and aesthetics that stiffen weary backbones and make space for seeing and speaking. In 2015, I was hired on the tenure track at Virginia Tech, an R1 university in the heart of Appalachia. My folklore PhD is unique in the Department of Religion and Culture. My colleagues' degrees come from anthropology, history, religious studies, literature, art history, and linguistics. Together, we exemplify the humanities as a field of allied disciplines that explores how people process experience, how we deliberate about conduct and value by means of debate, story, ritual, and material culture. Early in the 20th century, humanities instructions largely bulwarked a cultural canon grounded in classical antiquity, aesthetic analysis, and a presumption of historical objectivity. Since the 1960s, several critical turns have emphasized instead the socio-political circumstances that shape and are shaped by expressive culture. The field of folklore, at the crossroads of art and anthropology, rhetoric, and sociology, enlivens humanities-based conversations about meaning, identity, performance, and power, in part because folklorists have long been focused on the nuances of speaking from and about positions of otherness. We have attended to contexts and the ways that savvy individuals adapt to and shift them. We also know that scholars rise on layers of cultural brokerage, including an absolute reliance on local field workers, conservators, and artists. Public humanities is often imagined as a bridging endeavor that links the institutional to the everyday, or as a mediating impulse that translates the academic into the vernacular, packaging specialized scholarly ideas up as films, exhibitions, lectures, and mediated discussions. Public humanities might also involve, as it does for me, preparing students to work thoughtfully, ethically, and efficiently in sites like museums, libraries, art councils, and historical societies. In these usages, public sometimes names a mass audience imagined in terms of deficits, for instance, the public as non-academics. Public facing is another common descriptor of this work, suggesting an outward orientation, the opposite of navel gazing. But one directional knowledge transfer doesn't sit well for me with me. So I have opted to do public humanities within the academy, primarily by decentering the academy as the site of knowledge production. I aim to host and amplify rather than to bridge or translate. In my research, I try to disrupt dichotomies that bracket lay people, paying attention to what recipe books, football fans, and self-taught curators can teach academics about our own assumptions and limitations. In my classes, I ask students to apply analytical concepts in op-ed letters and public sector internships, but I also welcome local experts to campus and set undergrads up in many apprenticeships with beekeepers, welders, quilters, and the like. I want students to experience the achievement of innovation the complexities of knowledge transfer, and the meanings and markers of expertise. Experiential learning of the kind intrinsic to public humanities work is gaining traction in the academy. Administrative models that privilege revenue production mean that departments increasingly compete for enrollments. Facing uncertain job markets, students want evidence that coursework delivers marketable skills. Stung by populist critiques, arts councils and universities seek out new audiences and experiences, making perspective taking central to programming and degree pr progression. Sometimes this holistic purpose-driven approach is valorized as so-called authentic learning. But like many folklorists, I push back against the notion of authenticity when I sit on grant panels or advisory boards. The point is not to reify difference be between the academy and the public, but to envision publics and their knowledges as coextensive with historically elite spaces, as bodies always created through engagement. I was in high school when I first read Acosta's resonant piece about scrap quilts. It turns out that her poem was part of a groundbreaking 1973 gathering of Chicano writers at USC, a three-day public event named after the Nahuatl term for poetry. I am grateful for that attention to the imprecations of personal and political, material and verbal, creative labor and intellectual work. 
and intellectual inquiry, work that reframed the makings of my own four mothers and sent me on a path through the humanities that keeps the daily ever in mind. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you very much. Next up to speak is Diane Goldstein, Emeritus Professor at Indiana University's Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology and former uh, chair of that department. Uh, Diane's essay, which is in the section of what folklorists do entitled Advocating and Partnering, is titled Creating Public Policy. Diane. I think she's on mute. Oh, rookie mistake, sorry. Can you hear me now? Okay, uh, so thank you, Tim and Stephen, and uh, good evening, everybody. The phrase location, location, location is an old real estate cliche capturing the notion that location is essential when it comes to property. I've often argued that the same could be said of participation in public policy. Having what we have to say heard outside of our own field and making it matter depends on being in the right place at the right time. And in September of 1994, I had the good fortune to be exactly that. I was teaching in the folklore department at Memorial University in Newfoundland and working on a book on folklore and HIV. One afternoon, I received a message from our Dean who knew of my research asking if he could nominate me for Health Canada Committee on AIDS. I agreed, assuming that the committee was likely to be like any other Health Canada Committee and grandpa pa panel I had sat on, narrowly focused on health promotion. I was wrong. A few months later, I was contacted by the chair of the Canadian National Planning Forum for HIV AIDS, announcing that I had been selected to sit on his committee. And this committee had no small mandate. Our task was to develop phase two of the Canadian National AIDS Strategy. Although I hardly knew at that point what the table was in policy terms, I suddenly had a seat at one. Thanks to a knowledgeable and activist patient constituency, HIV AIDS governmental committees had begun to learn hard lessons about including widespread representation of stakeholders on decision-making bodies. Gone were the days when survivors would quietly sit by and allow scientists to make decisions about their health. We were a group of 25, including researchers from a variety of disciplines, people living with HIV AIDS, representatives of national non-governmental AIDS organizations, research funding agencies, federal and provincial officials, and A, that is only one, representative from the pharmaceutical industry. I was not sure how I snagged a seat on this amazing committee. Later, I found out that location, location, location had served me well. The committee chair wanted a representative from the humanities and also required representation from Atlantic Canada. I fulfilled both requirements. While the scarcity of HIV AIDS scholars in the humanities in the mid 1990s disturbed me greatly, so too did the slow attention to the virus demonstrated within Atlantic Canadian health sectors. The lack of a, congenial, of a collegial context for my work, which had previously been so distressing, suddenly became a personal asset. The humanities are crucial to developing and resolving policy issues. Our insights on diversity, history, heritage, expressive culture process and thought are as important, arguably even more important than the contributions of the sciences or technological fields to the development of effective public policy. We don't often associate the humanities with public policy because formal structures for humanities input into policy making are almost non-existent. 
But humanities scholars have also generally been reluctant to get involved in policy making, perhaps feeling that our role is to critique power structures rather than support them. Both can be the case, both should be the case. I felt that my presence on the committee was able to bring our topics, bring topics to our discipline that our discipline cares about to the fore. The committee's primary goals included mobilizing funds, finding ways to create new infrastructure, coalitions and collaborations, activating better prevention, detection and treatment programs, exploring the determinants of health, addressing poverty and marginalization as a portal to virus spread, providing global leadership and supporting clinical trials and drug availability. I had input on all of these, but I worked primarily on efforts to create formal networks that would facilitate research collaboration, including facilitating participatory research with community members and recognizing the import of sex workers, drug users, and other frontline grassroots individuals as community scholars. I also worked on the development of national ethical and legal guidelines for research, prevention, and treatment involving marginalized populations, including injection drug users, Aboriginal communities, homeless communities, rural communities, and the prison population. Our final report also included a statement that I was able to prompt about the importance of studying the development of public discourse and folklore around HIV AIDS. After the closure of our committee process, I was lucky enough to have numerous other policy opportunities come my way. Strangely, my mantra, location, 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 always held sway. My work on epidemic narrative and rumor topics, which were increasingly coming to the attention of public health decision makers, led to a number of appointments on policy committees. Through each of these appointments, I was able to establish the ethnographic, expressive, and vernacular concerns of folklore as crucial to health solutions and decision making. And through each of these policy collaborations, I grew as a folklorist learning where our field could and could not be heard, where we provided answers and where we did not, and finding better ways of addressing the needs of policymakers and the communities they and we serve. I grew to be able to argue that folklore provided a way to develop cost-effective, evidence-based public health solutions that advanced population health. If public policy is the process by which government agencies and organizations translate their vision into regulations and programs that deliver real outcomes, engaging the right players in understanding problems and solutions is crucial. Field research is one of the strengths of our discipline and good research should be one of the foundations of sound public policy. Much of folklore research can inform public policy, but it must be presented in the appropriate forms and context to impact policy work. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Now we will hear, we will hear from David Puglia, who's the Associate Professor and Deputy Chairperson in the Department of English Language and Literature at Bronx Community College of the City University of New York. Uh, David's essay in What Folklorists Do uh, is in the researching and teaching section that begins the book, and the title of his essay there is Teaching at a Community College. David. Thanks, Tim, and thank you everyone for being here. So yes, like, like Tim said, I'm a folklorist and a full-time faculty member at a community college in New York City for seven years now. Uh, so I'd like to share a short selection from my essay on what folklorists do at community colleges. So here we go. Community college, 13th grade, halfway college, high school with ashtrays, second rate schools for slacker students and amateur professors. Facing such grim, albeit flawed, public perception, why would any academic risk community college stigma? Well, not for everyone. For a folklorist wishing to teach introductory folklore and study local folkways, 
I found community college life not only adequate, but ideal. A community college is, in brief, an undergraduate institution where students can earn a two-year technical degree or complete the first two years of a bachelor's degree. Community colleges do not seek prestige. Access-oriented, they shun exclusive admission standards and exude the same democratic, populist, and community-centered ethos that folklorists champion. As a folklorist teaching at a community college, I teach introduction to folklore a lot, as two-year course catalogs lack the cornucopia of upper-level and special topics offerings. I consider myself fortunate, as introduction to folklore provides endless stimulation and satisfaction for me. In my role, I teach folklore and folklore methods primarily to non-specialists who take my course to fulfill an elective graduation requirement. For these students, the course amounts to a literal once in a lifetime opportunity to study and appreciate folklore. My modest goal is to encourage these students to carry on as amateur folklorists for the rest of their lives. Community colleges foreground teaching. Their faculty teach frequently, and by necessity, they also teach broadly. Since most humble two-year campuses cannot sustain four to five sections per semester of introduction to folklore, folklorists at community colleges must diversify, offering either kindred courses, bread and butter service courses, or cross-listed courses. Fortunately, folklorists are enthusiastic transdisciplinarians and talented curricular magicians. We can transform any teaching assignment abracadabra and poof, a folklore course appears. In the same spell of transmogrification, folklorists make for excellent shapeshifters, deftly melding into any department, an essential two-year institution skill. Community colleges bankroll no folklore departments, nor am I aware of any student earning an associate of arts in folklore. Folklorists at community colleges teach in other disciplines departments where they thrive at coexistence perhaps even animating their colleagues with the vernacular spirit. Some denigrate community college careers because of the perception that these jobs do not afford the time or resources to conduct research. And I can sympathize with scientists who might rue their lot at community colleges. A small teaching oriented campus often lacks adequate facilities for complex chemical or biological laboratory research. Not so for folklorists who quite the opposite can think of themselves as living and working in their laboratory. The community college gels with the community, offering the opportunity to study a community while hosted by an institution dedicated to community. The mere idea of a town-gown divide repulses community colleges. For inroads into the community, the staggering diversity notwithstanding, one trait community college students all share is from being around here. Despite my supposed expertise every semester, students in my folklore class are never fail to demonstrate mastery of city folkways I've never even heard of. For a folklore seeking community-based research, these students make for willing guides, and brilliant mentors, always eager to tutor the teacher. So in my opening, I speculated that community college on closer inspection might form the ideal job setting for a folklorist. The reverse may prove equally true. Folklorists are the ideal community college faculty members. In collegiality, in teaching, in research, and in service, the folklorist's raison d'etre shines at the community college, embracing community, spurning elitism, extolling diversity, championing democracy. As a community-based position for scholars interested in communities, folklorists and community colleges are a perfect match, a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship, one to encourage, nurture and increase. I hope more folklorists will pursue opportunities at their local community colleges where thousands of two-year schools give rise to favorable conditions for introducing the local community to the study of emergent and living traditions. And that, in a nutshell, is what folklorists do at community colleges. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. Finally, we're going to hear from Pat Turner. UCLA's former Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education and Senior Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences, and now Professor at UCLA's World Arts and Culture slash Dance and African American Studies departments. Pat's essay in uh, What Folklorists Do leads off the section of the book devoted to leading and managing, and it's titled Leading at a University. Pat. 
Thank you. And it's great to uh, be with everyone. And um, what Daniil said in her thank yous goes for me as well. Um, in the 1990s, when I was an assistant and an associate professor moving my way up the ladder of faculty, um, numerous people would say to me, I think because I know how to read a spreadsheet, um, I know how to uh, respond to emails, we need more people in the administration like you. We need people with your values. We need people with, with your astuteness. And I would get nominated for deans and vice provost positions once I hit full professor fairly regularly. On July 1st, 1999, I had my first day in one such position. And suddenly when the announcement went out and on that day, the same people who had urged me to pursue the positions in the first place and other people turned to me and said, oh, you've gone over to the dark side. It is the most common phrase that a faculty member who becomes a dean or other senior administrator gets, obviously hearkening back to Star Wars. In preparation for Tim's, uh, in response to Tim's request to write about this, I did a little probing of the um, higher education leadership literature on, uh, on deans and so forth. And there's an entire book with the title, The Dark Side, about that faculty transition from, from being um, purportedly on the light side, those of you familiar with the Star Wars motif, um, over to the world of Darth Vader. And it's a real interesting choice to turn to an underrepresented minority female and say to her when she's become a dean, after you've urged her to do so, that you've gone over to the dark side, keeping in mind, of course, that James Earl Jones was the voice of dark, that very dark Darth Vader. Um, I don't think that the position of, of Dean or of any senior administrator in the hands of a folklorist, uh, a good folklorist, um, is ever going to be anything comparable to what we get from, from, from Darth Vader. The skill sets that I found most essential in my role were ones that, I don't know that I necessarily learned them from folklore, but they were certainly part of what pulled me to folklore. You know, Tim already used that term that I love that he uses so much about the listening disciplines. And I think that the best uh, of us in administrators learn that the most important thing that we can do is listen. Um, I was surprised how important documenting became. Um, we're used to, you know, Daniil talked about her grandmother being a quilter and I've written a book on African American quilters. The most important thing you can do um, is make sure that your field notes are accurate, that you are translating from the conversations that you have with folks in the field uh, uh, well. And I was really surprised how many of my um, sister and brother administrators could go to a meeting, come away from it, without a sense of what got said and what the directions were. Go to meet with the chancellor, meet with the provost and walk away and not know what, what we'd been told to do. Sometimes a kind of vagueness, intentional vagueness uh, was responsible for that, but sometimes because people don't know how to listen and document and write things down. Um, and I think that um, most folklorists are very much accustomed to centering the marginalized, um, trying very hard to make sure that voices that are not normally heard are represented in our research. And the university is the same kind of field and administrators dealing with that same issue. We're trying to make sure that the voices that are not heard there are, are, are heard and the resources of the university get directed uh, towards such individuals. One of the ways that, that I did that was I, I put together a, a, a group, a student advisory group that um, um, was comprised of, of students who were not, did not hold any office on campus. I intentionally went looking for the most ordinary of, of students and um, fed them pizza once a quarter and solicited from them feedback on, uh, on, uh, on uh, what was going on at the university. I 
strategy that I used that um, served us well during the the, the run-up of the of the pandemic was a traditional sort of administrator has, and I had a very nice office. We have nice waiting areas. We can take people to lunch. I pursued relationships with people I would be dealing with. And if I were gonna be dealing with them regularly, I would say, let's alternate where we're gonna meet. So we'd meet in my very nice office, but then the next meeting would be in their office or uh, they're in some cases their cubicle. Um, so that we, so that that they had the sense that I was coming to them, the way our subjects in the field, we go to our subjects in the field and, and go to them. We didn't, we don't ask, a, a, never asked a quilter to come to my office. I did that once when it was the grandmother of one of my students, but anyway, uh, um, the, um, that really served me and I think served our campus well, my relationship with the head of the student body um, who, had to lead the student body through all of the things that happened with the pandemic shutdown um, against a backdrop of, of the university and a feeling that the people he was officially supposed to be dealing with, the chancellor and the vice chancellor of student affairs, were treating him very formally, but I was the one who had met in his office with him. And I was the one who would text him. And I became, as folklorist really, the translator between him and my, my brother administrators in that case. And I, I think it ultimately served the students quite well. So I don't think, I, I went from the dark side back to the light side on July 1st, 2020. Um, it's good to be back. But as I say uh, at the end of my uh, essay in the book, I hope that I can use the skills that I developed as an administrator in service to the field because I really have learned a lot about the ways of the force. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, and thank you all again. Um, so for those of you who have joined us this afternoon, you've been able to hear in the last few minutes what it is that at least fol four folklorists do. Uh, but I encourage you to remember that there are 72 other folklorists represented in the book, uh, and the, the whole range of, of, uh, of, of topics covered by the, uh, the 76 essays in the book are, is, is, is remarkably broad because the work of folklorists covers an awful lot of territory. You can read about uh, in the book about uh, folklorists working on photography as community advocacy, uh, as folklorists performing diplomacy, uh, engaged in community organizing, teaching middle school science uh, to First Nations kids in Western Canada, working in museums, working in radio, running an online school of folklore, uh, doing labor advocacy, to name just a few. So uh, what we've been able to present this afternoon is a small slice of a bigger slice of the great, big, wonderful world that folklorists live and work in. I think we are now ready for your questions. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, if you have a question for any of us on the panel individually or collectively, you can do it by using the Q&A button down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, Stephen, do we have some questions uh, queued up? We do. Um, so I'm on mute, yep. So first question we have up today is actually a two-parter. So do you think that folklore studies is unique as a field enabling multiple work experience or that the folklore situation, in quotes, false creative career choices? And second part is, could and or should IU Press now consider a series what <laughs> sociologists do, what astronomers do, and what physicists do, etc. <laughs> And that is for anyone or everyone on the panel. So, sounds like the second part of that question would be for you, Stephen. No, I'm not, I, I can't make that decision. <laughs> uh, I can I can start a response or provide part of a response to the to the first uh, to the first part of that question, and uh, not to fudge on it, but I think the answer is really a little bit of both. You know, I think that the training that folklorists receive. Uh, in those sort of general purpose, uh, uh, sort of ethnographic and listening skills and documentary skills and analytical skills and interpretive skills, their training in lots of different fields that brings them to folklore, uh, all enables them to, to work in a wide variety of settings. But also the fact of the matter is that 
the, uh, the you know, difficult times in standard academic occupations for folklorists or what, what were such occupations um, uh, has, has, has sort of pushed folklorists in the direction of being uh, inventive and creative. And as actually as one of the uh, authors in, in the book says, uh, scrappy. Uh, about finding, uh, about finding and, and carving out new occupational possibilities for themselves. So I think the answer is a bit of both, but that's just my take. The rest of you. I, th I mean, I think uh, folklorists have an advantage in like our, our training is fundamentally interdisciplinary from the start, right? One of um, the the things that I loved about my first year as a folklore graduate student was um, learning where all of my colleagues were coming from, right? As we sort of embarked on this new field together. Um, and I think, um, I think folklorists were, were fundamentally uh, concerned with the relevance of everyday life, right? And so we're prepared to make those kinds of um, adjustments to the context that we're in, but I think because um, you know folklore as a, a discipline and as a sort of career trajectory hasn't been entrenched in these structural systems, right? That you get the certificate and there's a um, a job waiting for you. I think that 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 um, is challenging in some ways, but it also helps us make use of our skills more effectively. Um, so that's that's my two cents. I think the one, uh, to return to one thing I mentioned a minute ago, um, one of the things that makes folklorist approach to their work and approach to the world uh, interesting and useful is their background in ethnography uh, and, and, in, um, uh, and in listening, as I've said. Uh, so that I was thinking a bit about the idea of, you know, the, the what astronomers do book or the what sociologists do book. I think that actually, uh, not to disrespect any of my friends who are astronomers, or sociologists, but I think those books might be more interesting if, if folklorists had the opportunity to do some education of astronomers and sociologists about the uh, about the, the the sort of listening and attending skills that uh, that we have within our field. I actually have a, a if I can sort of jump in with a question. Um, I, I had a question for Diane um, about. Uh, so, so, so Pat and David talked a little bit about the kind of mindsets and skills that help them uh, succeed in campus spaces as cultural spaces. And I wonder, Diane, if you could talk a little bit more about the kinds of skills and, and mindsets that help you negotiate um, public policy spaces as cultural spaces, right? So um, building on Tim's idea of, you know, wearing our ethnographer hats, right? Were there things when you entered these public policy spaces that you felt like you were particularly um, able to, to see or to recognize because you have that ethnographic background? Mute again, Diane. Steve, you're supposed to help me with this. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. I uh, thanks for the question, Daniel. I um, I think what runs through all of the policy situations that I've been in that has helped the most is that generally everybody else at the table um, in those situations is uh, oriented toward a particular way of seeing things in a particular um, group's perspective. And one of the, as a folklorist, we're more used to being able to access the perspectives of many groups. So that's one thing. And it's also, I think, another thing that runs through an awful lot of what makes folklorists work for, be able to work for policy 
in policy situations is the ability to move back and forth between what regular people think and what institutions think. And so I think that that translational ability is really important to being able to do policy work. And actually that leads us really well into our next question, if that's okay. Um, so we have a question from the Q&A that says, I'm struck on how interdisciplinary, uh, uh, interdisciplinarity plays a role in your, the thinking and the institutional positioning of folklorists. Could you speak to the value and challenges of living in this world? The question reminds me of a, a meeting that was held about, I don't know, 15 years ago uh, that the American Folklore Society sponsored. It brought together representatives from the field of folklore, oral history and ethnomusicology to talk about the situation of, of, of fields, most of whose members in the academy worked in departments that had some, somebody else's name over the door. I don't mean I'm in the name of another field over the door. Folklorists in an English department, ethnomusicologists in a school of music, oral historians in a history department and so on. And as we, as the 12 of us or so that were there worked through that meeting, uh, we sort of moved from an initial understanding that uh, working under, you know, under somebody else's name sign was a problem to working under somebody else's name sign was in fact an opportunity. And that, uh, you know, because there are, I don't know what the number is, 16, 20, 24, uh, you know, folklore departments, programs, and centers in the U.S. and Canada right now. Uh, and but folklorists work in hundreds of institutions in universities and outside. Uh, that in fact uh, demands of us uh, a, a, a kind of uh, interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity uh, that uh, both comes with training in the field, but is definitely developed by professional experience after our education, our supposed, you know, formal education is done. I could speak to, you know, one of the challenges that I feel like it just crossed my desk today. Um, in terms of, you know, the departments with other signs, we're frequently, those of us in universities and our ones, as Daniil talked about, um, you know, I have to weigh in on the merits and promotions of my colleagues in these departments. And, you know, there's a case that I, you know, have to vote on for a colleague that's in linguistics, um, overlapping in my area, but, but I feel, um, I'm hoping someone else on the committee for this faculty member is far more grounded in linguistics than I am. Interdisciplinarity suggests you've got command of several disciplines. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's not always the case. We can sometimes speak a slice of the pie of another discipline. You know, we'll know that really well, but I will not be able to voice, I will not be able to support my colleague and know that this person has covered the right range of resources, the right uh, of, 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 of um, you know, I, I won't be able to read their bibliography with care uh, and, and know whether or not this person is missing something. And so I think that's one of the challenges of, of always being out there. You, 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 you can be superficially engaged uh, academically, certainly know more than the, your graduate students do in these areas, but it doesn't give you the command that someone who's grown up in those fields have. In my essay, I use the term of transdisciplinarian rather than an interdisciplinarian, um, because uh, like Pat said, interdisciplinary to me, it seems like it could put up a barrier at, a, at any moment, but transdisciplinarian at least at a community college, you're, you're sliding into those other departments. Um, you're, you're going to be surrounded mostly by people who are have degrees from other disciplines, but you're, as folklorists, I feel like we're, we're great matchmakers. We, we, uh, we can fit into that department and have a relationship that, that works. Um, so uh, for me, transdisciplinary, and it was the uh, accommodating term. I think one challenge might be that, um, you know, we, we get our, our formal training in institutionalized spaces and academic spaces 
um, which are still very interested in specialization, regardless of sort of the, the rhetoric, I think, about interdisciplinarity sometimes. I remember um, several years ago, the American Studies Association, which is also interdisciplinary, did a study um, and they found that people who came out of American Studies departments with American Studies degrees we're not really likely to get hired in American studies departments. The actual departments wanted specialists in history and literature and culture, right? And so the in in um, academy spaces, we still have these uh, these um, you know turf that people are, are trying to protect and um, establish their own expertise in. And I think if we think outside those spaces, um, that the interdisciplinary the interdisciplinary training we have, and also the, the emphasis that we have on sort of per, performing identities, right? And understanding various discourses and how they intersect um, can be a real boon to you know, graduates of, of folklore programs. But I also think that, um, that we need to, to, to practice knowing how to perform those identities and other kinds of spaces so that they make sense to people and, and that, um, all of the, the many different spaces in which folklorists are working, musical theater, stand-up com comedy, working with medical students, right? Um, we need to sort of practice making that transition from these more regimented spaces into um, all the, the really amazing opportunities that are out there for folklorists. I think it's also worth saying that folklorists, um, many folklorists, are tr both trained in the humanities and in the social sciences. And I think that allows them to cut across many disciplines. So we're getting towards the end of our time. We have two great questions in the Q&A, but if anyone wants to try and squeak in a last one. Uh, so is the term folklore an asset or liability when crossing boundaries outside of the academy's job markets? Well, I think a good folklorist should always make the term an asset. Um, you know, our job is to erase you know, if there's any preconceived notions that are negative on the parts of our audiences, I always tell my students, you know, go in there and tell them how fortunate they are that you have the skill set and that you have uh, the, the range of reading you have and everything. I do think it, it works best if we move forward with the assumption that they're so fortunate that, uh, that we're bringing folklore to the table. I think it does require, again, careful listening to, to see how are people receiving that word, right? Because there's so many different ways that it can be read. Um, you know, uh, working here in the, the mountains, people are very excited about the idea of folklore. We may not always have congruent senses of, of what that means, right? So having a discussion about um, people's um, assumptions, the experiences they bring to that term, I think is a, a really important part of the process of making it um, an asset and also recognizing that there are synonyms, um, vernacular culture, right? Uh, the, the skills and the knowledge um, and the artistry of everyday life. Those are all uh, ways that we found, I think, to communicate that term in, in useful ways. But there, it's important to remember too that there are, are people for whom and communities for which the term folklore or other terms like it uh, are, are taken as, as, as negative, as belittling, as pejorative. Um, and there's some history in the world that would, you know, that provides some evidence for that point of view, uh, uh, particularly in, in many traditional communities. So it's important for folklorists to be aware of that situation and to take up the challenge of responding to it uh, because um, it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated argument to make, but it, it's one that involves, and once again, this goes back to the point we keep returning to, uh, it involves uh, deep and committed uh, uh, 
uh, listening with the goal of empathy. Great. All right. Let's let's have our last question. And actually, this is to synthesize together um, because it makes a great finisher. So given everything that we've said today, how would you form a coherent statement as to the value proposition of the field? And do you see any changes in the future? And by the way, may the force be with you. <laughs> uh oh. Well, you know, I, I don't mean to be tautological about this or to, uh, or to simply uh, try to hawk books, but the fact is, you know, value propositions are usually supposed to be concise. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you can't say it in an elevator ride, you know, if you, if you can't say it, um, you know, in a slogan, it, it's, not, it's not sufficiently honed as a value, pro value proposition, but I would say that this book as a whole is about is the value proposition of our field. I don't I don't say that to escape the question, but the fact is the value proposition of the field of folklore studies is a is a complicated one. Uh, perhaps there is a need. We talked about follow up books a minute ago. Perhaps there's a need for a follow up a book about you know what folklorists do best, uh, and and in that a value proposition could be stated more concisely. But if if any of the four of you have an idea for a concise value statement step up right now. I would just say that the that multiplicity and and mess is often a good thing in terms of um, helping us think carefully, right? And from from different perspectives about a particular topic or or even the, the idea of value in general. And so uh, for me, I say the kinds of discussions we have about the name of our field, about the contributions of our field, um, are really valuable in, in making it uh, still relevant to the, the messy and complicated world that, that we live in and helping us find the places where um, we can learn from people and apply our skills and knowledge in useful kinds of ways. Anyone else? All right. Well, uh, I believe that we have no other questions. Is that right, Stephen? That's correct. Okay. So I, I believe that brings us to the end of our session this afternoon. I want to thank all of you. Uh, I can't see you, but I'm looking at you. Uh, I want to thank all of you out there for uh, being part of this session with us. Uh, I want to thank you for your interest in the subject. I certainly want to thank you for your interest in the book, which you can order from anywhere you uh, prefer to buy books, including the IU Press website. Uh, the book, I hope, will start conversations that will continue over many, uh, many years in many settings. Uh, but I, uh, it is, it was, this project was very definitely a group effort. Uh, and I, my deepest thanks go out to all of the 77 contributors to what folklorists do. Thank you all. And thanks to everyone who was here this afternoon. And on behalf of the press, I'd like to reiterate that. Thank you to our esteemed panelists and for everyone joining us today. Um, there will be a version of this recording posted live on YouTube in a couple of days. So if you'd like to watch it again, it will be there. And if anyone has any questions, please feel to reach out to us and we can get them answered. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.